we're going to breeze through this uh, somewhat quickly, especially in terms of the, the aspects of the law, primarily because the law is designed to protect you as franchisees and impose burdens on franchisors. So a lot of times I'm having discussions with franchisors on what they need to do to comply. If they're doing the right thing, then uh, there shouldn't, there's really nothing for franchisees to do with the law except for understanding what's there and why it's there. We've been talking a lot about the franchise disclosure document. It's something that the uh, Federal Trade Commission has uh, set forth that needs to be provided to every prospective franchisee. Um, several states regulate franchising. We'll talk about what that means in terms of their registration requirements uh, and the disclosure requirements at the state level. But again, the, the uniform uh, concept here is all franchisors are going to prepare and deliver a franchise disclosure document. That's what we keep calling the FDD. Um, 23 items, and we'll go in uh, through some detail as to what those are. Quick overview, because again, these are uh, regulations which impact your franchisor, nothing that the franchisee has to do. Uh, under the federal law, the, the FTC franchise rule, the franchisor has to prepare a disclosure document and deliver it to you 14 calendar days before you sign any agreement or pay any money. Um, so that's a quick and easy thing. If the franchisor is saying, here's your disclosure document, this is the first time I've talked to you, now give me a check today, you know that something is up. Um, but a lot of times the franchisor, for example, will say, um, look, you know, I know we've got timing issues, I know you're signing a lease and we've got to figure out how I can get you your disclosure document and get my registrations ready and sign you up and work the timing like that. So these laws do impact sort of the timing of the signing and the closing. Um, again, there's no filing with the federal government. The, the FTC basically just requires franchisors to deliver the document. The FTC never reviews it. Um, this used to be called the, uh, if you have been around franchising for a little while, it used to be called a UFOC, Uniform Franchise Offering Circular. The FDD is the new term since about 2007, 2008. Uh, and again, the purpose is to assist uh, the, you guys, the prospective franchisees, uh, in making an investment decision by disclosing what's relevant. The 23 items that are listed in the FDD are there for every single franchisor. The information in the FDD is there because the FDD is simply a series of answers to questions that federal law asks. So all, franchise, all FDDs should have, for example, the address of the franchisor, and that's the reason it's there is because the FTC rule says disclose the franchisor's address. They're trying to make it as uniform as possible so that as prospective franchisees, you can compare apples to apples for each of the franchise opportunities. You know, item one is general information, trying to describe the franchisor, its business, how long it's been operating. So one of the critical things is item one is find out how long the franchisor has been in existence. Um, that's going to help you uh, determine the longevity of the system, how new it is, how much risk is involved. Leads right into item two, which is the experience of the officers and directors and the principal executives. Um, a new franchisor is not, by definition, uh, a risky investment. Uh, it's one that you need to inquire further uh, than something that's been around and tested for 35 years. But who's running the show? What kind of experience do they have? Um, are these the founders who just started the business a year and a half ago? Um, that's a, a higher level of risk. Are these people in item two all franchise industry veterans who've been through various different companies and are now running this franchise program? That can give you a whole lot of comfort. Now, obviously, this could change the day after you sign, but it at least shows you uh, currently where the franchise system is headed. Litigation, you've got to find, read which litigation it is. If you've got franchisors who are seeking to enforce system standards, uh, that can be a good thing for franchisees. Uh, if you've got franchisors who have, uh, in two years, 17 uh, lawsuits filed against them for fraud, that's something you need to take into account as well uh, and make sure that you're understanding what's going on there. Uh, bankruptcies uh, used to be a heck of a lot more relevant uh, 10 years ago or five, even five years ago than they are today uh, because there's a lot more franchisors that have uh, bankruptcies listed in the FTD 
simply because it's not the franchisor that went bankrupt, but because somebody who's an officer of the franchisor, that last company went bankrupt. So it's a pretty broad disclosure to get at the history. Um, but again, just because this, the uh, you know, senior vice president of franchising at this franchisor was a vice president of operations at a different company that went bankrupt, yeah, it's worth, again, it's worth inquiring about, but uh, that's one where I think a lot more folks have been uh, having disclosures in the recent past. Yeah. Initial franchise fee, when it's refunded, uh, that's item five, so that's obviously a big financial component. Um, but understanding not only what you're paying for, but what you're getting in exchange. Uh, item six, this is a litany of the fees uh, that are payable ongoing in the franchise relationship. Uh, again, very useful information as you go through, but the last point is what I would focus on. This does not include payments to third parties. So item six is all the money that you would pay to the franchisor or its affiliate during the term of the franchise, so it's going to cover royalties, it's going to cover marketing fund contributions, uh, it's going to cover product and service purchases, but it's not going to cover purchases uh, from independent third parties, it's not going to cover your lease payments. Uh, so there's, again, a limited piece of information there, albeit critical. Item seven, uh, one of the uh, most important items, I think, for prospective franchisees, because as we said, figure out how much it's going to cost to get in. And this is what answers the question. Um, item seven should be very detailed, should provide a lot of footnotes explaining things. Uh, this is, keep in mind though, just the estimated initial investment. Usually the amount that the franchisee is likely to have to pay for uh, begin from starting the business to the first three months of operating. So it's just that short window. This isn't a break even point. Um, one other critical point is there's a lot of charts that you'll see in item seven, uh, and they'll stack all of these up to figure out how much it's going to be in the initial investment. But in the footnotes, you'll find described what exactly is the model that they're talking about. For example, if every single restaurant is 5,000 square feet and the initial investment table is 5, 000, for a 5,000 square foot restaurant, well, you've pretty much got a, a, a decent idea. But a lot of times, you'll have ranges for how big the franchise can be and how some of the different variables. Uh, and so I, I can think of one franchise chain that's in the, they do health clubs, and they can do a, anywhere from a 15,000 square foot health club to a 100,000 square foot club. Um, obviously, those are some pretty big cost differences. So when you're looking through and trying to do your planning and your business planning, and you're looking at the franchisor's item seven, make sure you understand the model that they based item seven on. And if your restaurant is going to be twice as big as the standard size, there's no problem with that, but then you've got to adjust your item seven figures and make sure you understand what the real cost structure is going to be. Item eight is uh, focused on sourcing of products and services. Um, this is one where uh, it's helpful to understand what's going on and where the franchisor is making their money. Um, there are disclosures here about rebates that franchisors receive from suppliers to the system. Um, and so that can tend to be a hot button in some franchise systems where a franchisor uh, is uh, getting a rebate based on products that the franchisee purchases from a third party supplier. Um, it's all about, again, understanding what and understanding why. Uh, there are many franchisors that will say, if we collect these rebates, we'll give them back to the marketing fund or we'll re refund them to franchisees. Uh, there's others that franchise systems that say, nope, that would be our revenue, but we use that revenue to uh, sort of grow the sourcing department. So understand, again, what revenue the franchisor is getting and what benefits they're providing you what are some of the supply chain services that the franchisor is providing in exchange for that money? The franchisor earns revenue from franchisee purchases. So this is direct purchases from the franchisor. Uh, if you're in a product distribution franchise, for example, uh, you shouldn't be shocked when this number is very high because your whole point is to buy the product from the franchisor. If you're a Baskin Robbins franchisee, you're buying the ice cream from the franchisor. That's going to, the franchisor is going to make a lot of money on the ice cream. Um, if it's a business format franchise, 
and there are a lot of products that aren't seemingly critical to the operation of the business, and they're all being purchased from the franchisor or its affiliate. You need to investigate that and understand why. There may be very good reasons for that. The franchisor may get fantastic pricing and pass that along to franchisees. Um, or there could be not so good reasons for that as the franchisor is using that as a hidden profit center. It's all about understanding what's going on and why things are structured the way they are. Uh, item nine is just a cross-reference chart, uh, which is not terribly helpful. Uh, item 10 <laughs> is uh, uh, information about financing programs that the franchisor offers. It's a critical aspect of what's going on, and if a franchisor has an established financing program, item 10 will describe a lot of those details. Uh, item 11 describes the obligations that the franchisor has in supporting the franchisee. Critical information, especially at the outset, you know, is the franchisor going to be there? Per, how much training do they provide, for example? And there's detailed disclosures and charts about all of the training program and how long it lasts. Uh, there's lots of disclosures in item 11 about the advertising fund. And it, uh, I would use that term a couple times, but an advertising fund, a marketing fund, uh, that's essentially uh, a pretty common in franchise systems where a franchisor, in addition to, say, collecting 4% of revenue uh, or 5% of revenue as a royalty, will require all franchisees and all company-owned stores to pay a 1%, 2% of, of revenue into a fund uh, that the franchisor controls for advertising and marketing. Uh, these funds usually provide the franchisor with pretty broad discretion on how to spend the money for the benefit of, mar of marketing for the whole system, um, but that's not money that goes into the franchisor's bottom line. That's money that's used and sort of by contract, they have to use it for certain purposes for the benefit of the brand. So for larger brands, that's where the national advertising comes from. This is where the TV commercials come from. Um, even smaller systems will a lot of times have a marketing fund uh, that will help uh, you know, fund all of the, the brand development and growth programs. And again, investigating how this works is critical as well. In some systems, the franchisees can control the ad fund. Usually that's, I haven't seen that in much in startups, just some of the more experienced ones. And, mo and many of them are moving away from that. Yeah. But, you know, you can get historical information to how the marketing fund's been spent. You know, has the franchisor spent 50% of its intake on just administering the ad fund? Well, that's not very good. Are they spending it a lot on, you know, programs that franchisees feel are very worthwhile? And you can understand, again, how the breakdown of the money is spent. Item 12, uh, again, is important in terms of the territorial rights and restrictions uh, that uh, you will have as a franchisee. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of, you know, can the franchisor put another branded outlet uh, within a certain area? This is all in item 12. Um, it, that's where the description goes in terms of what your rights are. Can the franchisor put another outlet in a uh, sort of a standalone unit? Can they do it in a stadium in your territory? Uh, can they uh, uh, sell product through the grocery stores in your territory? So all of these things will be described in item 12, uh, and this is the one area where uh, the earlier comment was make sure if they make a promise that it, uh, it gets in the franchise agreement. And this is the one area where if, as a franchisee I've heard the questions asked of franchisor, you know, does this mean that you could put one you know, I have a one-mile territory, so does this mean that you can put one at the corner of 4th and Main, which is, you know, just over a mile from my outlet? And uh, the common franchise or salesperson refrain can sometimes be, yes, but don't worry, we would never do that. <laughs> that may very well be true, but if it's important from a contract perspective, it needs to be in the contract. Uh, item 13. Uh, describes the trademarks and the trademark status. Generally there, you just want to make sure that the trademark has been around for a while, has been used for a while, so that then you can feel comfortable that it's going to be protected. Uh, 14 is patents and copyrights. Uh, 15 is the obligation to, to participate in the business. Um, if you are in this for an investment and you don't necessarily want to be behind the counter all day, 
uh, that's a much, you know, you need to look at item 15 and make sure that that's part of the franchisor's business model. Item 16 is restrictions on what the franchise may sell. Um, I can summarize this uh, for 98% of franchisors, I think item 16 will say the franchisee will sell whatever we tell them to sell. Uh, item 17 goes over the terms of the contract. It's sort of a summary in chart form. Um, you should be kind of looking at your contract anyway, especially having a lawyer look at your contract, but this is sort of a summary of some of the key terms on termination and transfer and renewal. Uh, 18 is public figures, if they have a public figure that's helping sell the franchise. 19, we mentioned it earlier. Item 19 is one of the key uh, critical points, financial performance representations. The only information that a franchisor or any of people acting on its behalf are allowed to provide concerning profits, sales, or income has to be in item 19. Now this was a big push from the FTC a few years ago when they had a lot of franchisors that said, uh, when a, a prospect would say, what's, what's, you know, well, how are these units doing? And the franchisor would respond, I can't tell you. And the FTC got pretty bent out of shape about that and now has disclaimers all through the disclosure document that you'll read, which are the same for the same paragraph appears in every single franchise disclosure document. In 95% of cases, a franchisor can absolutely provide some information for, in terms of historical data if it has that data. Now there are some random instances where the franchisor really hasn't done the outlet that you're talking about at all, so it can't tell you about it historically. Those are obviously some dicier investments from the franchisee side. Um, more and more franchisors are putting item 19 information in their FTD because more and more prospects are asking about it. Um, these, as opposed to the rest of the disclosure document, which is pretty uniform, answers the same questions, Item 19 can be different for every single franchise or they can construct it almost any way they want. The critical point in item 19 is, just like in item 7, look to the footnotes. The footnotes in item 19 are going to describe, for example, um, you could have a full P&L uh, earnings claim or a financial performance representation. So they'll tell you they have 50 corporate stores and they'll provide a full average revenue, average cost, average bottom line uh, of all the 50 stores. Well, you're paying a royalty, 4% of royalty. A corporate store doesn't pay the royalty. You should be looking at the footnotes. Sometimes those, the footnotes will say, yeah, we imputed a royalty there, so we took off 4% of sales from the bottom line because you'll pay a royalty even though the corporate stores don't. That's okay. Some of the franchisors won't, and they'll just put it in the footnotes. By the way, you have to pay a royalty too. Keep that in mind. So you'll need to understand those when you use those item 19 numbers in order to prepare your business plans. Um, either way, it's all about understanding the information that's been given. Uh, again, and one other piece from a item 19 perspective that's uh, critical is this uh, supplemental FPR. It's a lot of work, so a lot of franchisors won't do it uh, as a regular matter, but the idea is uh, financial performance information that's tailored for you. So for example, the franchisor provides in item 19 uh, gross, average gross revenue for all 100 outlets in its system. Well, you're interested in opening up in an urban location, and you know there's only 15 urban locations in the franchisor system. So what you can ask them to do is give me the, gross, the average gross revenue for just the 15 urban locations, because that's more tailored to what I'm going to do. Or just the 20 largest locations, because I'm going to do a larger location. Somehow tailoring the information they give you so that it applies to your specific circumstances, and they can do that. Many franchisors don't provide an FPR. Uh, many of them don't have the data, just choose not to provide it. So what are your alternatives? Um, you can look to other systems. Uh, that's a pretty dicey proposition because uh, that's not an apples to apples comparison whatsoever. The second one is the big one. Uh, call the existing franchisees. Franchisors are restricted in the, uh, earn, or the cost sale, or I'm sorry, in the sales income and profit information that they can provide. Franchisees are not. 
Franchise, other existing franchisees can tell you anything they choose to. Now, that's not a statement from your franchisor, so it's not legally protected in the same way that if your franchisor is tell, some, doing something that's not truthful, you have lots of rights and remedies for that. Not so if a franchisee is not telling you the truth, so it's a little bit less trustworthy of a source in some cases. But call around to different franchisees and see what they'll tell you. And most of them will be uh, pretty forthcoming, especially if they're invested in the system, they're looking at growth. From their standpoint, the more outlets they have, the, more, the better funded the marketing fund is, the better health the system is. And so they'll want to help the franchisor grow the system, and they'll tell you information about how their outlets are doing. Uh, item 20 is another critical piece for a prospective franchisee to look through. Uh, this is the data on the number of outlets that opened, the number of outlets that closed, the number of outlets that transferred. Um, and I think one critical thing here is try and get behind the numbers and find out what some of the concerns are. So if you're looking in Illinois, and you saw that there were uh, 10 outlets in Illinois uh, that closed during the last year. Ask the franchisor why. If those are 10 individual franchisees that all went out of business, that's problematic. If those are 10 stores that all had you know, one, uh, it, one owner that just decided he ran out his 20 years of his franchise agreement and decided he was done and closed up shop, that's a different story. If you have you know, transfers, for example, transfers can be bad and transfers can be good. The bankers get nervous when there's a lot of transfers around there, but as a franchisor and a new franchisee, getting new blood in the system to replace some longtime franchisees who may have lost interest and want to sell out to new franchisees, those could be great things. So understanding, trying to figure out what's going on and why I think is critical in item 20. And here is where you will be provided names and contact information for all franchisees in the system, uh, or for most systems anyway. Larger ones can just provide sort of the, the closest geographically to you. And then all franchisees that have left the system in the last year. Uh, this is an unbelievably critical part of your due diligence. Um, call them both. Call franchisees who are near you. Call franchisees who are far away from you. And have a good list of questions that you're looking for. You know, how does the franchisor support you? When things went bad for you, was the franchisor there? Did they try and help? Um, you know, a lot of franchisors will come in and say, they'll, you know, they'll give somebody some, all right, you're behind on your royalties. Tell you what, I'll give you a couple months to pay it off over time. But I know you're trying to get through the hump, and I know you're, you know, something happened. The street closed in front of your location, so the franchisor is going to help get them over the hump. These, this is the type of information that you need to know, and you can only get that from existing franchisees. You should also be calling the pro the people that left the system and asking them why. Um, and again, expect you know that those conversations might not go as well. Um, but try and understand from them what was their beef. Were they happy with the franchisor and it just didn't work out? Um, or are you hearing a recurring theme that when you talk to three of them, they're having the same complaint about the franchisor? Well, that may be something that you should look into a little bit. Item 21 are the audited financial statements for the franchisor. Uh, item 22 are the contracts. Uh, all of the agreements that you'll sign with the franchisor or its affiliates need to be attached. And then item 23 are the receipts. Uh, these are the receipts for the disclosure document. Um, it's, the fran it's a federal law requirement that the franchisor gets you to sign the FDD receipt. Um, I said earlier there was a rule that said they can't do anything for 14 calendar days after they sign, after, you, uh, after they disclose. You have to wait 14 calendar days before signing an agreement or paying money. This is how they prove they waited their time frame. So if you're asked, if you're handed an FDD and said, please sign the receipt right now, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not bound to do anything. Uh, all, they're, all that you're acknowledging is that you actually got the disclosure document. State laws are there to protect you. These are the states that have franchise registration laws. Um, again, this is what the franchisor needs to comply with. If you're in one of those, these states, if you're operating your business in one of these states, 
you know, then you might want to look at and think about, you know, should you contact your state regulator, see if the regulators have any information about the franchisor. There, there's another set of laws out there called relationship laws. These states will uh, override some terms in the contract. Um, they vary widely depending on what they protect and what they cover. Um, these are really kind of after the, uh, the franchise sales process. I want to jump in a little bit to negotiations. You know, the franchise agreement is drafted by the franchisor to protect the franchisor. Um, I'm the one that does it, so I can tell you that's what we're doing. It's not fair. It's not balanced. And it's not that way because, and obviously I'm biased when I say this, but the relationship is set up in a way that it is not two equal parties because you don't have the same roles. All of the ones that we were talking about earlier, about the franchisor protecting the brand, the franchisor controlling the system, and the franchisee implementing the system, that's at the heart of what this agreement provision is. So understanding that in some cases there may be little or no room to negotiate, but under, it's important for, for you folks to understand what the contract says, understand exactly what the franchisor's expectations are and what your expectations are, so that going into it, you have a clear plan for where you're going. Always, uh, as we said earlier, critical to talk to a lawyer who knows franchising, um, because if you get somebody who is a very smart uh, wills and general contract and real, and real estate lawyer who really doesn't know anything about franchising, they may look at this contract, think it's one-sided, and try and negotiate and waste a whole lot of your time and money and the franchisor's time and money in things that really aren't going to eventually benefit where you're headed. So again, when you're thinking about what the agreement says and how you want to approach it, figure out what your goals are and what's most important for you. Do you need to be able to bring in other investors in two years? Are you going to involve your kids? Or are you going to have other partners come in? These are things that you can try and figure out, OK, this is in my plan for the next year. How will the franchise agreement impact this? And can I talk to my franchisor now? You know, if, my, if getting my kid involved, I want to make sure my kid's going to be able to go to training in a year so that he or she can take over in two years. I mean, that's sort of the planning. And again, making sure that you have an exit strategy. You understand where the end game is, what the goal is when you're leaving. If the franchisor will negotiate, again, you want to focus on the areas that are important to your goals. You're not going to get everything. Um, we have, a, it's unbelievable how many times that I will get comments back from a franchisee lawyer, even at a, a more sophisticated, larger firm, who says, again, as I mentioned before, you've got to promise me that you won't ever change the system in 10 years. And it's a non-starter. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, that's inherent in the franchising relationship, and it doesn't make sense for the franchisor to negotiate that kind of provision. But there are some areas where they might be flexible. Uh, term. A lot of times a franchisor will, have, uh, will, will be a little more flexible in the term that they'll give you uh, if you can tie it to make sure it's tied to your lease term. Because you don't want to be left with a lease but without a franchise, or with a franchise without a lease. Um, renewal rights. Um, it depends. There are some franchise systems that say that as long as you uh, are continuing to operate in accordance with the agreement, you can renew the franchise agreement perpetually. Uh, there's not that many that say that. Most of them have, okay, 10 plus two five-year renewals. Sometimes you can negotiate those provisions to understand what the, what's going to happen on the back end. Um, sometimes you can negotiate protections into what the contract will say, as most of them on renewal say you'll sign the then current form of agreement. And, you know, you again, sort of as we said earlier on development rights, which you may be able to say is, okay, you can swap my form of agreement in 10 years, but don't change my royalty. Keep my royalty the same. Franchisor may be willing to talk about that. Uh, franchisors almost always ask for personal guarantees. Uh, it's really hard to limit these, as uh, difficult as those can be. We talked a little bit about uh, territory. Training and extra help. Franchisors, good franchisors, love to train. Because they know that the more training, the more assistance they give you, the more likely you are to be successful. So it's very, unless you're trying to get a franchisor to come out of pocket for 20 grand for something, 
it's gonna, if you ask a franchisor for more help, can you send some more people down for grand opening assistance? We'll figure out the costs. It's gonna be really hard for them to turn you down. Again, limits on ongoing fees. It's kind of hard to uh, implement, to, to get a franchise or to curtail those over, say, a 20-year contract term. What you can try and do is focus on, you know, treat me the same as you treat other similar franchisees. Um, that's one thing that, you know, is sort of a, uh, the power of the collective. You know, the franchisor is not out there to bleed every franchisee because then the whole system tanks and the franchisor is left without franchisees. So that's not in the franchisor's economic interest anyway. Um, fixing the critical areas of support. Um, we talked, to, that was what we were talking about in terms of training, additional assistance. Um, limits on remodeling, uh, remodeling stores, especially uh, stores with older systems. Um, you've got to refresh, you've got to rebrand, you've got to make sure your image is current. Um, but a lot of times these things are, think, you know, that can be done in through a period of years. Um, so for example, there are fran some franchisors will say, okay, if you build a new outlet, I can't have you completely remodel it for the first five years. Or I won't force you to remodel during the last two years of the term when you won't be able to sort of make your money back on that investment. Uh, narrowing non-compete is kind of hard because the franchisor wants you really focused on this business, but it's, again, understanding where your goals are if you want to be able to engage in other businesses. Um, easing transfer restrictions, this is more really talked about. I want to give my, transfer the business to my, to my son or my daughter. Can, can we figure out a way to, uh, to get that done in the front end? Um, again, limiting termination rights, that's going to be pretty tough because as a franchisor, uh, if things aren't going well, they need to get the sign down pretty quickly.